All right, so after my talk earlier today, someone asked me this question. Why you know you use semicolon in your JavaScript? Uh, a fantastic question, and I actually thought that it deserved a more thoughtful response. And actually, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately as I've been working on designing the GraphQL language. I actually think that semicolons and commas should be considered white space, and I'll explain about what I mean in four acts. So programming languages are amazing and powerful. By typing on our keyboards, we can express all kinds of logic and ideas. And we can do that because programming languages use punctuation to provide structure around all those other ABCs and one, two, threes. But there's another super important part of programming languages that I think we probably just don't think about as much. And that's the negative space, the voids between the forms. Code is written to be read, not just by your computer, but far more importantly by you and me. White space helps you improve the legibility so you can see the logic in your code, and it's often totally up to the programmer or your company style guide, I guess, as to how you're gonna use that white space. When we write programs, we're almost always writing lists of things. Lists of values in an array, lists of arguments to functions, and lists of statements that we want the computer to execute. One of my favorite families of programming languages, and in fact one of the oldest, is Lisp. It means list processor. And in fact, all you can do in Lisp is write lists. But most of the languages that we use day to day, they derive from C. And they use commas and semicolons all over the place, especially for lists of things. That leads us to fight over whether we should do this or this, or ultimately like fighting to change the language so we can make it possible to do this, and really that's just trying to balance legibility with like maintaining blame lines and version control. It's a stupid thing to fight over. And it can also lead to some confusing behavior. So in an old version of JavaScript, this happens. Um, this happens today, undefined. That doesn't sound right. We can fix that, there we go. Or like, I don't even understand what's happening here, not a function, what? Uh, oh right, I forgot a semicolon. So commas and semicolons are significant, and whether you include them or not can change the meaning and behavior of your code or lead to syntax errors. So that's gonna lead to developer mistakes, bugs, and less legible code. So there are a few languages out there that have fully sidestepped the problems that commas and semicolons can present by omitting them completely. Lisp is one of those examples. So here's just an, you know, a list of numbers. And here's a function call. And here's a list of expressions to run. There's no ambiguity about where one item in the list ends and the next one begins, so there's no reason for commas or semicolons in the first place. And GraphQL also works this way. We actually borrowed this idea from Lisp. In GraphQL, there's no ambiguity, so we also don't need commas or semicolons. And as a language designer, this is actually a pretty interesting challenge to make this work. We gotta be really careful to avoid the kinds of ambiguity problems that languages like C and JavaScript suffer from. And if we do it right, it means that we can you know, avoid all this accidental misinterpretation, uh, which means fewer bugs and less confusion. So back to white space. Even though most languages ignore white space when running your code, we still understand that it serves a very important purpose for helping us to read and understand code. But I think white space isn't the only thing that can help us make code legible. Sometimes commas and semicolons are actually pretty useful to understand what our code means. So maybe we don't wanna get rid of them, we just wanna treat them like white space. Not significant for running the program, which forces us to make sure there's no ambiguity, but still available if we need them, or we can omit them if we don't. And in fact, both GraphQL and most versions of Lisp, they support this idea, they let you do this. So if we look at that array of numbers in Lisp, maybe it'd be easier to read if we put some commas in there. And most Lisp languages, like Clojure, they let you do this, even though it means exactly the same thing. Uh, and this maybe helps our trailing comma problem. So you can do this, that's fine, or you can do this, that's fine, um, or maybe you just do this and this is fine too, why not? Commas could be there purely as a legibility aid if you want them, without fear of things getting changed. So if you work on programming languages, or you want one, please consider commas as white space. 
Hello. Uh, so, hey, I was here last year, um, but I was talking like for half an hour. So I'm going to basically uh, do away with all the boring 25 minute and just go straight into it. Um, so this today, I'm here with Pusher. So we, we're outside. If you want to kind of find out what we are, uh, we do like real time stuff, um, web sockets at scale, which is really fun. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is I need your help, right? So I came up with like a hack the other day which I was wanting to test out, and I thought this might be a quite a good place to test out. So what I was wondering is whether or not we can use audio and the web audio API to synchronize devices. Um, so if you were here last year, you're gonna like know why I do this kind of stuff. Um, but what I'd like help with is I wanna use your devices for it. So if you could visit brb.pusher.io, and you should see this little kind of diamond thing, um, hopefully. Basically, like the diamond kind of rotates slowly. I'm going to open it up so you can see. Um, this is like kind of raw canvas and maths, and I've spent far too long on it. Um, so, yeah. Are people able to see that? Cool. Nice one. Um, so, what we're going to do is I'm going to change this so that <coughs> it should request for access to your microphone. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to run that through an analyzer node and pull out which frequencies come out of it. And this is kind of like hacked together a little bit, so it only recognizes two frequencies, like 330, 350 hertz, and 450 hertz. So, oh, it's recognized something. <laughs> That's probably in my voice. Um, so what we're gonna do is, is everyone seeing that? Is it turned black? And if, it's, if, the, if the diamond is turned black, that's because your device doesn't support to get user media. Um, so what I want you to do is turn your devices around here, and actually, sorry, just bear with me one second. Right, because this is an experiment, I want to kind of try and record how this works so I can know if it's gonna work or not. Um, so if you could turn your phone so that it's facing this camera here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, right, so I can see a few black phones there. I'm going to start playing some tones through these speakers, and hopefully all our screens should change color at the same time. So, cool. That worked a little bit. So you can see some phones have changed blue because they've detected that at 350 hertz. Cool. So I'm recording this, and what I'm trying to work out is whether or not there's a delay going up which I can utilize for positioning. Okay, so we're going to try on this side of the room now. Kind of sketchy. So what we're hoping is that you'll see a sweep if you slow it down quite a lot. And then this is from the other speaker. And then this one's interesting. This is blue on this side and pink on that side, which totally doesn't work, <laughs> which is good to know. And back again. And then just finally, this should be blue coming across here, which we can, that kind of works a little bit. Uh, and we're going to pan across. Right, okay, cool, thank you very much for that. Like, so, as a thank you for that, like, so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna use that to give away a prize. So what we've got is, I've got a little BB-8 robot unit. Have people seen those outside? They're like a spherical thing. Um, basically, we're gonna use our diamonds that we've got on the screens to give away that prize. So if you hold your phone up, um, and what's gonna happen is they're all gonna start flashing in unison, and when they stop flashing, they're, gonna, they're making sounds as well. When they stop flashing, one person's gonna get a red screen, and that person's gonna win. Cool. There you are, you won a BB-8. So uh, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, I think that's me. Thank you very much. Uh, cheers. And I'll, I'll come and bring one, that to you later. Uh, cool. Right, bye. Um, hi, I'm Samuel. And I want to um, show you a pretty cool service that I just recently discovered. I'm not affiliated with that in any kind, so I just think it's generally cool. And the name is HyperDev. If you already know about this, sorry for stealing your time. Everyone else... Uh, Check this out, it's pretty cool. So you can basically think of HyperDev as something like JS Fiddle, but including a Node.js server and a pretty neat dev environment. So if we go to hyperdev.com,
we get an instant environment, so we have the front-end part, which is nothing special, and, but we have also a back-end part. And if I open another tab here, this is the, like the default, um, uh, the default project. I can just type anything in this index, HTML, of course. And hmm. <laughs> Sorry, you shit. Oh, nice. Okay, sorry for this. I wonder why it's not working. This is the best timing. Um, okay, then I just tell you about it, uh, about the features without showing. So we have the, we have the backend part and what it is, is it's actually a Node.js server with Express and you can just instantly go and type server stuff and I think what they do is they spin up a Docker container with um, with some resources, and everything is live on this um, URL then. So I hope it works, it's working now. Okay, doesn't like me. Okay, to the server part. Most of you recognize, okay, this is, uh, this is Express, so I change stuff, and in the server logs, I can see that as soon as I change something, it is actually deploying a new server. So I just changed the endpoint of this, um, of this uh, JSON, uh, and there it is. So the change got, Deploy it right away. And this is pretty neat. So if you, if you want to do a prototype or you want to do some um, hackathon, for the hackathon there's even extra cool stuff. So you can invite people to your, uh, to your environment and then you can co uh, do collaborative coding within the editor. So therefore I We'll just post this in the Slack channel, and you guys can join me. So, you can see the cursor of other people's um, doing stuff there. Uh, that's pretty cool. And you can export stuff to GitHub, and you can import stuff to GitHub. Um, there's no history of any kind, so if you if you fuck it up here, it's gone. If you don't save it, um, yeah. Anything else? So, go to server.js and change something. The people that are already joined. <laughs> Yeah, I think my time is up. Thank you. Okay, my name is uh, Javier Marquez. I work as a front-end engineer for You Can Book Me. And I'm here to introduce uh, 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 React tiles, that is uh, a React component, so we are talking about React. But um, uh, it's based on an idea that is a really, really general idea of uh, since all the front-end applications can uh, handling routine, so uh, um, that means that every application can um, understand the routes and uh, URLs and translate it to the screens that you know. So if the applications can uh, handle the routine, why can't we um, show more than uh, one route at the same time? So this component, what it does is just load all the routes of, uh, of your application uh, in the same screen. For example, 
I have just opened the sidebar root in the right side, um, and the home root is in the, in the left side. And you can open more and more tiles as you need it. And uh, you may think, what? why the hell I need more uh, roots all at the same time if I'm struggling to show just one root? Uh, well, it's, it's uh, kind of useful if you have, for example, a user list at the left, and you can edit uh, a couple of users at the same time, comparing them and all the stuff. And um, uh, this uh, component uh, allows to, to do so, no? It's uh, like a, a top-level component that you may uh, like to place it uh, 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 at the top of your React uh, uh, tree. And, uh, and it handles all the routing uh, by using the standard URLs. For example, I am using here um, a React Router for the routing, but uh, it, I have an, a small adapter that, uh, her, um, that makes uh, React tiles to understand the routing and communicates with React Router to open more tiles. Um, since you have tiles, um, uh, you can use it whatever, um, in the way you, you like it. You can uh, uh, resize them. You can uh, even open floating tiles. So if you need to have a look quickly to some, some, some uh, data you may, you may need, you can resize uh, the floating tiles. You can dock them also. Uh, it's not working here, maybe here. Uh, you can close it, and since it's uh, working with URLs, um, the browser can uh, the, the browser history can be used to to navigate through the through the tiles. So it's uh, it's really cool. You may also use um, the tiles to load uh, uh, external uh, URLs if you if you want it. Now it's not working. Oh yeah, it is. Uh, here, here we are. It is um, the React doc uh, documentation page. Uh, so you, you can close them, the trials, and you can uh, uh, resize. Um, this component comes with um, a link component too, to, um, that helps you to open the roots uh, in one place or in a different place or in the same child that we are already. Um, it also came with some uh, some uh, utilities to know what's the uh, current layout and helps you uh, uh, and helps you you know uh, 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 don't uh, open too many windows at the same time too many tiles and it's uh, in a better stage I think it needs a lot of job uh, yet uh, but uh, it's quite usable. I am usable in some personal projects right now. And uh, if you may want to have a try, yes, I'd be, I'd be glad to with uh, any feedback. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Mark. Uh, I work for, a, I found a small company uh, in Berlin called Embassy. Um, and I'm going to talk about how to generate API documentation with Webpack, React, and Swagger. So I have a few requirements where I want to have my documentation done on, on the web. And uh, so the first one, it has to be cheap. I have no money, so, you know. Um, it has to be fast. Uh, so to be fast, it has to be static. Uh, I wanted to have the separated concerns. I wanted to have different kinds of different, different pages everywhere. Um, I want it to be crawlable by Google. Uh, and I want to use push state. And I want to have an API playground. So Swagger isn't a great, or Swagger UI isn't a great solution. I love Swagger, but you, know, you can't really use Swagger UI for representing your company and representing your API to your users. So uh, I'll show you a quick demo. Um, whoops. <laughs> uh, what's a hotkey for getting like uh, mirroring windows? Does anyone know? Uh, how do you win mirror windows? Mirror displays. Okay, so here's the documentation. 
Um, so this is just a, well, a website, of course, um, and it's uh, fully uh, React um, statically generated HTML uh, with push state. Um, as you can see here, I've got loads of different pages. Some of these things like look pretty similar. You know, I've got like the request body, I've got the, the responses. These are the sorts of things that you can put in in your Swagger UI, your, your, your JSON. Um, and I can do things like authentication if I want with this. Uh, and I can put in my different, you know, eight different scopes. Uh, and I even got a playground where I can sort of uh, try out different operations, like this one here, for instance, it takes no form field, so I'll just try it and I get a result. And here's my JSON information. You do other ones as well. So that's it. Um, how does it work? So let's go back to this. Oh, hang on. want to get my note, there it is. Okay, so first of all, I'm using swagger.yml rather than JSON because it's kind of easier to work with. Um, I can load up loads of endpoints, uh, resources and tags. These get really big in your, in your, 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 your swagger documentation. So uh, I use JSON ref to split it all up and, and, and create smaller files. Swagger tag, obviously, is, you know, I've got these sort of, you know, this tag here, and I'm using some, some I'm hacking uh, Swagger a little bit for its capabilities. There's no concept of nested tags, so to build that menu you saw on the left-hand side, uh, I needed to sort of use a delimiter, like a slash, for instance, and the tag names. And then I use the external docs URL uh, to generate the paths, that's where you see when the paths change. Um, and of course, Swagger allows you to use Markdown. So you see all those pages that had Markdown in it. Uh, then of course, I need to link the, the tags and the operation definitions. And that's where all the operation definitions will get put into those pages. So I had to do a few things in order to get there. Uh, the first thing I had to do was actually had to load the, the, the Swagger YML into it. And of course, there's no plugin or loader yet. So I created one called Swagger Loader. Um, it basically just loads YML or JSON, um, compiles it, turns it into, uh, into a dereferenced file, and you can, you can then uh, uh, load it in as JSON to, to your application. Um, and so then uh, connecting up to, to React, React Router, you see I have a few paths, like you know, the index route and you know, different like, sort of OAuth route. And, uh, but then I have an API route, and it has child maps, uh, children, and that all contains the information which I want. Um, so then I had to build a React Router Path Extractor Webpack plugin. Naming is hard, so I, I, I built this to, to, to extract the paths from React Router and put them into uh, React Router, uh, React, no, sorry, Static Site Generator Webpack plugin. And that basically just takes a flat array of, uh, of paths and just generates all the HTML that I want. Oh, shit. Hi, I'm Jan, and I want to share an, an interesting library I found on the weekend while building a mobile app. So uh, this is um, a website I've been building uh, some time ago. Uh, it's on Heroku. It just uh, does nothing very special. You just add um, some notes, uh, like uh, hello from the web. Oop. There you go. Uh, just add this, right? So it's, it's something that I use to more or less like a diary. And my, um, my weekend project was to bring that to uh, make a mobile uh, app out of it. Oof. So weekend project, build a mobile app to store the notes, make it work offline, and celebrate success. So uh, I read a bit, I read a bit uh, about possible solutions, and I found a tool which is called PouchDB, so similar to CouchDB. But it is uh, written in JavaScript, and it can run on uh, any uh, yeah, JavaScript environment, can run in a browser, or uh, one of the popular mobile uh, frameworks that use uh, JavaScript right now, like uh, React Native, that was my uh, choice. So it is a very minimal, minimal uh, document store, but it has uh, the interesting feature that it's compatible to CouchDB's uh, sync feature. So um, it can sync to CouchDB. Uh, but also works offline. The same, same is true for Cordova, uh, Ionic, or uh, NativeScript, or whatever you want, and even in a browser. 
and uh, surprisingly easily uh, um, I could I could make this work so it was really just a, in like in an hour or something let me show you how the code whoops no sorry how the code for that looks uh, so implementation is really like this so for the local version you just um, uh, or create a new PostDB object, then you create a remote DB by URL. You have my login credentials there. Go to town if you want. Uh, it's just a demo account. So, and then uh, the magic here is like this: uh, this simple sync command, uh, which which uh, on app start will directly uh, sync all of the information to to the remote database. Uh, and here, the the live feature is actually listening to changes that are being added to to the uh, cloud version or locally and uh, automatically syncs it. And the retry feature here uh, will actually uh, uh, care for, when you, when you get offline or you get uh, into uh, airplane mode, as soon as you go online again, it will automatically sync. So, demo time. Um, I have a little app here running. So you can already, also already see, hello from the web um, that, I, that I added before. Um, Hello from mobile, Oop. so uh, this one is uh, sadly not uh, <laughs> listening to change automatically, but if I add something here again, wait, sorry. stay in front, um, test, wow, test two, it uh, will add automatically here. So it's offline ready, it's working well, and um, yeah, very happy with the outcomes. Um, here are the specs. So it should run in uh, any kind of modern browser. Uh, Opera as well, that was actually a reference to the uh, talk earlier. So um, yeah, with, uh, uh, sometimes uh, you find these blog posts that are easy and they actually work. So I wanted to share that with you. Yeah, hello, I'm Marek Piasecki. I'm not giving up. I will show you uh, two demos uh, today. Uh, of example applications of uh, um, not uh, React uh, component based uh, um, library. Just a second. Where is the pointer? Okay. Okay, I need to use mirror display, sorry. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the example uh, application of uh, um, Imba. It, it's built in with Imba. Um, so I'd like to tell you some uh, stuff about Imba, but it's uh, hidden right now. So uh, it's uh, also component-based uh, library. Uh, it's uh, uh, older than uh, React and other stuff. Um, it's faster, like 50 times faster. It has nicer syntax. Um, uh, it uses different uh, approach for uh, speed. Uh, instead of virtual DOM, it uses uh, caching. Um, and uh, you can use all this uh, stuff you learn about components, uh, including um, managing state with it. Uh, but uh, also it has uh, some advantages, um, like virtual DOM is uh, next layer you need to learn, and here is uh, here is gone, and also um, there you al always can be uh, uh, can use uh, any web standard that exists uh, because it uses real DOM. So you don't need to be worried if uh, there is um, a wrapper around some feature of uh, anything in written in Imba. You can always use uh, web standards. Mm. I will show you also another application, which is uh, quite more com complicated uh, in interfa interface. 
Yeah, it's for animations. It's for building animations uh, for children. And it has a, a lot of uh, controllers. Mm. I'd like you to sh show all, all the movie, but uh, I'll better switch to the uh, information about repository, which you can check. Um, yeah, just. Just go there and uh, give a start to, to an author. Uh, uh, version 1.0 will be uh, released uh, till the end of this month. And uh, it will be more documentation then also about Imba. And also a lot of video tutorials. So thank you.